Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you so much for, for being here. My name is Phoebe Scott. I'm a curator at National Gallery Singapore and one of the collaborating curators on the exhibition Ever Present. So before, before we formally start, um, I'd like to give an acknowledgement of country. So as part of Aboriginal and nowadays Torres Strait Islander customary practice, when visiting the homelands or country of another community, it's important to be welcomed by the traditional custodians of that place, if possible. Where this is not possible, then the visitor still needs to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the country that they are visiting. Acknowledgements of country allow the visitors to recognize and pay their respects to the traditional custodians and to be protected by the ancestors while visiting. So as the artworks in Singapore have traveled from, from Australia, um, we'll be acknowledging the traditional custodians of the country from which the artists came. And National Gallery of Australia have very kindly given us a, a lovely form of words to be able to do that, so I'll read it now. We respectfully acknowledge the traditional custodians of the country where each First Nations artist resides or where the art in Ever Present was created. We recognize their continuing connections to country, community, and culture, and we pay our respect to their elders, leaders, and artists, past and present. We respectfully acknowledge all First Nations traditional custodians whose art we are currently exhibiting in Singapore. Well, good afternoon. And before I, I introduce the fabulous artists who are with us today, I feel that we need to say a few words about why we're here in a tent. Um, because this is, this is a, definitely a novel experience to have a tent pitched in the City Hall Chamber. Um, so the, the, the space that we're currently in is actually an artwork. It's an artwork that's part of the Ever Present Exhibition. It's called Embassy by the artist Richard Bell. And Bell's work is commemorating a very important event in Australia's history and in the history of the struggle of the First Peoples of Australia for rights and recognition. So as I'm sure many of you will already know, and certainly as you will have seen if you visited the ever-present exhibition, the colonization of Australia was a traumatic and violent experience for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. And this oppression did not end with the establishment of the Australian nation state. Forced or even violent dispossession from land, suppression of culture and language, the genocidal policies of the stolen generations, and more, continued through the 20th century. In 1972, a group of First Nations activists set up a tent on the lawns in front of what was then the Parliament House and proclaimed that space as the Aboriginal Embassy, um, a space for the First Peoples of Australia to speak from and to finally be heard. And that tent embassy still stands today, 50 years later, as a powerful testament to that movement. And that late 1960s, 1970s period also marks the beginning of meaningful political change for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. In recreating the tent in this artwork embassy, Richard Bell reminds us of this powerful history and also offers a space for further discussion, advocacy, and the imagining of a better and fairer future. And it's in that spirit that, that we put up the work here at National Gallery Singapore and present these artist talks today. And after all, you know, what, what better space? Here we are in the historic City Hall Chamber, one of the most important historical sites in the story of Singapore's independence. And I think a very fitting place for the voice of the people to be heard um, right at the heart of Singapore's former City Hall. So today we have with us two brilliant artists. They both have work in the ever-present exhibition in Gallery 3. Um, and their work also speaks very powerfully to the idea of social and political engagement. You know, they're artists who I think really look bravely into the face of history um, and into the contemporary realities uh, for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in Australia. So I'm very glad to have here the artists Julie Goff and Tony Albert and I'd like to, to introduce them now. So Julie is a Chorawulwe artist, writer and curator of First Peoples Art and Culture at the Tasmanian Museum and Art Gallery. Her work and research practice often involves uncovering and representing conflicting and subsumed histories, referring to her family's experiences as Tasmanian Aboriginal people. Goff holds a PhD from the University of Tasmania, a master's degree from the University of London, Goldsmiths College, and bachelor degrees in visual arts, prehistory, and English literature. Her artwork is held in most Australian state and national gallery collections, and since 1994, she has exhibited in more than 150 exhibitions in Australia and internationally. 
including major survey exhibitions and biennales. Tony Albert is of the Girima Yadinji Kukuyalanji peoples and has a multidisciplinary practice which investigates contemporary legacies of colonialism, prompting audiences to contemplate the human condition. His works encompass text, video, drawing, painting, and three-dimensional objects, especially examining the legacy of racial and cultural misrepresentation. Albert has exhibited extensively nationally and internationally in group and solo presentations, including most recently NIRIN, the 22nd Biennale of Sydney in 2020, uh, the National New Australian Art in 2019, and a number of other very important uh, group and solo shows. So it's so wonderful to have them here with us from Australia today. So I'll be asking Julie to speak first, followed by Tony, and then we can have a joint Q&A. Um, so yes, thank you very much, and let's, let's welcome, please, Julie Goff. It's, um, it's a great honour to be here and to be part of the exhibition that uh, is um, also in such um, important company with another 149 or so artists from around our continent of so many hundreds of nations. Uh, so yeah, I really um, thank the National Gallery of Australia and of Singapore for uh, bringing me here. I've um, got uh, the, this, yes. So um, I'm re resident of Nipaluna, that's Hobart, on the island of Luchawita, Tasmania, at the very bottom, the very south of of uh, con continent Australia. Well, it's actually not the continent, really. I think we would if we could um, become independent, but <laughs> probably economically an unsound idea. Uh, yeah, so if I head south, I hit Antarctica. It feels like it right now, in fact, that we're in in the cold weather. I'm, I'm, I'm going to proceed through a bit of a, a talk through my artworks because it's easier than um, it's easier to look at those than at you. Is that that's a bit pathetic? Um, whoops, it's a high stall for me. Whoops. Um, so um, I've I've got almost the same number of thematics in my work. I've started to move them into different groups and it's kind of like curating your own exhibition and so I found out I've got five themes at the moment but which is kind of like ever present with six yes um, but of course unless you want to stay till midnight I can only t I'll speak through two themes I think and show works and then in discussion later maybe others will come come up that I will neglect now a little bit so I'm going to speak to um, the idea of the lost world and this attempt that I have to try to understand what happened on my island home to my ancestors. So my family, since the 1840s, have lived near La Trobe in the north of the island, about three and a half hours from where I live. Uh, but my ancestors before the 1840s, our country's Tebracuna, I'm just pointing to northern Tasmania, whoops, um, Tebracuna in the north, about four hours northeast uh, rather than northwest. So... There's this sort of triangular situation where I, I can drive to home country or drive across to mum and my brother and our more recent country or back down to, which is the centre of government, etc. Hobart, a very different place that I don't feel as comfortable in, but it's where I've, I uh, live. So Lost World is just, I think, the first thematic very much about trying to piece together my life and my ancestors' life and through that sometimes it appears that there's the bigger story emerging about what happened to cross our island to our ancestors. So this is where I grew up, however, and I was a child in a milk bar, not behind the counter. I was in a high chair, in fact, like this. Um, and apparently I sang along to the Beach Boys in a jukebox, which, because I'm pretty old, so that's the era. Uh, but this is, for me, partly explains, I think, growing up off country, we call it, in another place than my ancestors, I think is what's led to me wanting to understand more than is usual or uh, tr try to return to and um, continue to make sense of something I think growing up elsewhere has created that in me, which is then why art has become my vehicle to share that. Because this is my uh, ancestral home country, which looks a little different. So, lost world. When the British raised their flag uh, opposite the city of Hobart in 1803, uh, things quickly became um, disastrous and genocidal for Aboriginal people. Um, in fact, within the first year, there was a massacre. Uh, children were taken. And 
uh, vaccinated against smallpox, so things that emerge in the records are often uh, odd and peculiar, involve baptisms, sometimes death records, sometimes things like this, medical records. How to find my people on our country during this first, particularly three decades, post-1803, is what really um, obsesses and possesses me, really. The um, land grants and looking at what happened in terms of our removal and then the um, onset, onset of the gifting of land to newcomers is, um, I think, part of the way to understand what happened next. So those first three decades, that's um, small print there, between 1804 to 1832, 3,125 amounts of land, sometimes to the hundreds of acres each, um, even thousands for several colonists, meant that um, as a result of that Aboriginal people were no longer able to stay on country, welcome on country, and were becoming disappeared from country. And not a lot of that is recorded, apart from some massacres. Um, so for that work, that's my first video work, 2009, I um, typed out the land grants and it became the basis for the work. And it actually kind of penetrated my memory such that when I meet people across my island, colonists, um, when they say their surname, sometimes in my head, um, they, this emerges, I sort of, they say something like O'Connor and I think, oh, 9,000 acres. You know, it's sort of, there's a bit of a problematic association with, with people. <laughs> that persists. I didn't realise that would create memory work of this nature, but it, it has helped me. I, I've got a fairly faulty, you know, brain database, but it's, it's in there somewhere. Yeah, typing this out, which shows, I think, well, I think a lot of artists are a little bit OCD and I'd be, um, yeah, one of those. Um, working with names on maps and trying to understand the histories that are often elusive or erased that might indicate Aboriginal presence. Um, such as these and places called Picaninny Point or um, even even um, even more racist terms than those. Uh, looking at the same time, at, so the, the sort of the residue, the remnants, the clues and feeling like it's a perpetual detective task to make sense of what those that perpetrated uh, violence against Aboriginal people um, often didn't want it recorded uh, because there was, it wasn't, um, by government edict that people were allowed to do this, to remove Aboriginal people, to replace us with sheep and cattle, for example. So but these clues include tracking the locations of the original land grants, which um, helpfully still often have on the, on the fence and the gate the names given to these properties by the first colonists. So it's and these inadvertent and useful um, it's a, yeah, evidential um, remnants of the past are still there. In the last 12 months, the government's um, nomenclature board and the mapping processes, they've create, they're retiring a whole set of maps of our island and they're replacing them with a, dif a different scale map. And But at the same time, they've taken off the maps for the first time, the names of these colonial properties. They Now they're just little, like, little squares without, so until I didn't, you don't always know how important something is till it's gone, right? And to me, that is um, really very much a, a cover up. Of, I think nomenclature just, well, they're reducing the scale slightly, it's probably impractical, but for me, it's quite serious because um, each, these properties of the early first two decades um, are those where they had uh, assigned convict servants with firearms, but also themselves and their, their sons were um, act actively removing Aboriginal people. So, you know, this, this is serious and I think needs attention to replace, to re return the names to the maps, particularly of those first two decades of um, uh, colonial properties such as this one. So our island, if you see up in the exhibition, the shell necklaces, these, that's one of the continuing uh, cultural traditions of many thousands of years and this is, Often a question in Australia is, oh, is there evidence? Is there archaeological evidence? What is, you know, this truth of something needing a particular number of years to be, and the accuracy of, of Western science? But in, in any case, they've, our shell necklaces have been excavated um, from cultural sites and um, 
are well, around 2,000 years they've survived, which is for a shell that's quite long anyhow in, in our climate and um, terrain. But my, my family didn't inherit the, the skill and the um, tradition of shell necklace making my mother's family. My father's a Scottish immigrant after 1948 to Melbourne, but my mother's family is where I am uh, and how we are Aboriginal people. Um, this necklace is a kind of a memory, a memorial work to, to the loss of that tradition in my immediate family, but also to think about the long and deep and embedded history of us on the island through, through the coal, before coal became such a, a marker of the death of the planet, in fact. But the antlers are referring to the hunting grounds that the middle of the island was very much against our people by the colonists, but it became um, also one where introduced species were hunted when they had killed and exiled our ancestors to offshore islands. So that that's the antlers are kind of referring a little bit to that. <clears throat> the, I'll, I'll walk, just make my way through several works and speak about others. So uh, as well as research in archives and on maps and speaking with people. There's also the trying to understand the country, this idea of lost, us being lost from country and country from us, our, our country, our place, is um, this work, Lost World, is actually one where my brother and I tried to revisit, spend time at a really significant cultural place for our ancestors that hasn't been visited hardly since the 1830s. Um, and so it's overgrown. We, it's not cared for in the way it once was. Um, it's very difficult to get through, like so, and to by um, most of our island is, is now um, very difficult to navigate because of private property fences and gates locking us out. So this is one of the works where I'm attempting with my brother to do this via riverways. <coughs> uh, this was a little half-baked effort involving t um, tyre tubes and um, was a little unsuccessful in terms of water transit. I've since moved to kayaking, which is a little yeah, more improved version, the successful version. Um, <clears throat> we tried for 12 hours to, to find a place that should be two kilometres. Um, we were very lost and covered in leeches. So each of these kind of attempts to understand and be on country and be ourselves on country, whatever that might look like, but also try to feel is... Um, often thwarted, you know, and there's, so there's a kind of humour in, some of my work is about horror and other times it turns into humour because the soundtrack for this piece is, for example, um, more and more phone calls recorded later from our telephones we'd left in the car um, of my mother and my brother's wife and becoming more and more worried about us, you know, and here we were not able to be on country like our ancestors, you know, safe and... Um, able to navigate. Instead, we were, you know, um, fairly getting um, very lost and very leech, uh, leech bitten instead. So it's, um, I think this is really about, yeah, trying to return without necessarily the understanding of what might evolve and how that might look in an artwork. So sharing something uncertain before you start what that would be, I quite like the that way of approaching it. This is a, 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 an opportunity for a residency in, in the UK and I decided to res respond to the stone tools from my island held in the collection at the University of Cambridge. In, uh, and uh, that projection is actually on the building where Stephen Hawking worked, opposite the Museum um, of Archaeology and Anthropology. So these stone tools, I felt sad. I couldn't bring them home. I couldn't take them back to Tasmania. Things may change more and more. Is repatriation something that museums are willing to, um, you know, bring to the surface and negotiate? <clears throat> Instead, during this period, I um, I took back to my island the um, photographs of the stone tools, and set about trying to find out where they'd come from. So then I had its opportunity in amongst the apology, you know, to the tools back in England and to the country that I couldn't return them to, but I was able to, um, it, it, some kind of strange instructional, or some kind of exercise where you're not sure what you might encounter, whether it be the, the, the people that now 
often hold the private, so-called private land. There's this um, set of tasks and then recording those. Um, other works, again, just trying to understand the immensity of the loss of our cultural objects, our ancestors taken from country to collections around the world, and um, us trying to um, build again even a vocab vocabulary of our original languages. This is a more recent work that's still in Sydney at the um, Sydney Biennale, just a fairly poor photo, but this is, um, shows my new um, stage two kayak. It's improved. Don't try a tire tube, even with a tarp on top. It doesn't work. Um, this is a kayak that folds like origami. It's pretty amazing, but I'm not on commission, so I'm not going to give the name of the company. No, no, I could. You could ask me later, but um, it's 12 kilos over a shoulder strap. So you can walk, right? You can walk to a river, which this, uh, and you could get out anywhere at the river, and you could technically hitchhike and put it in the back of someone's car, you know, so it just change, it changes everything, such a kayak like this. And this is a covered in stone tool stickers, and the, in front of the kayak are 3D printed stone tools from the museum in Sydney that again are off country. Um, in fact, one museum in uh, England's Pitt Rivers Museum has 12,000 of our stone tools. Can you believe that? 12,000. By um, particularly one person, one collector over two years who came from England and was obsessed and managed to ship that many back. So these are all... Um, extremely problematic for lots of reasons being off country but also off, off Australia because they are um, indications of what um, Aboriginal heritage departments called evidence of occupation and if, if we don't have evidence of our occupation on our country then uh, people can like companies can put in for a permit to destroy to build a, 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 you know anything a dam a house a a factory. So these are really important for lots of reasons, including protecting the country that they came from, but also to um, for us to reconnect with our ancestors and what they made by hand. Um, on the on the video projection is is of the kayak journey, and I didn't know where I would end up in the journey or what the film would be made of, but it ended up being me um, reaching a rock called Native Rock. Uh, when I got there, um, there's a big whirlpool in front of it. It's very, it feels uh, powerful there. It feels like I could enter another realm through the whirlpool. And um, then a friend who lives near, not far from that place was, I said, how can, what, why is it called Native Rock? And she found in a 1920s newspaper from the, from the region that uh, it was said to be the place where the local Aboriginal people had their last stand, you know, that, the attack upon them was at that place. So that became the end of the film um, to reach that place. Um, visiting museums. It's just uh, now for the last four years I've been working in one in Hobart as a curator. So that's another, there's a tension for me in, in, in supporting or working in one as well as trying to critique them and understand what the future might be for First Peoples it, with regard to them holding our cultural objects. Um, and responding previously to this kelp water carrier held in the British Museum. So this, this is one of our significant surviving objects from the, from the 1800s. It's our traditional bucket made of the kelp from the sea and a stick and woven string. Uh, there's two that survive in the world that are known to survive from the 1800s. So the video work for this was um, visiting, making a kelp carrier myself from the place where I think this was made, but opening and closing, taking it out of the box for a moment because there's a great sorrow in you can't do much. You feel I feel personally a bit guilty that I'm visiting and can't promise anything to it beyond it's like visiting a prisoner, you know, that's how I feel. <clears throat> These are the some of the colonial properties from the period of what was known as the Black Lion. Uh, it was uh, also, it's 1830, for six weeks, in the end of 1830, the government created something, the military operation against the Aboriginal inhabitants of Van Diemen's Land. So all of the colonists um, in the settled districts and their servants were issued firearms, handcuffs, ammunition and supplies to try to drive all Aboriginal people down to the Tasman Peninsula, which is the bottom 
left side of our island. Um, and although that was not successful in terms of numbers captured, it led to a big, the final surrender um, three months later of, of those people that were left, including um, one of my ancestors, direct ancestors. So these properties are, are um, the biggest and the most implicated in this, journey, this encouragement to the government to undertake something like that, which happened. Um, and uh, so the, I collected a stone from the gates of, gate of each of these um, 28 places and um, filmed the journey between them and some of the correspondence, including the letters to the government. And these are the signatures from six districts of our island thanking the government for their attempts to um, deal with the natives. <coughs> um, going to reach some, I'll go to the next topic, theme two, because um, of time. Um, so, yeah, in amongst that horror and that history is, is what is happening to our people and trying to understand who, who our ancestors were at the time of the British arrival in those first three decades to account for them, to account for the dead, but also um, to understand what we've all inherited on the island, Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal people. So this is a school text from the 1950s ex explaining for um, children, because until um, relatively recently, um, the state government, uh, through education system and through um, the ways that Aboriginal people were described, which was as um, half um, language that's um, violent in itself. But basically we were told we didn't survive as a people, Tasmanian Aboriginal people. And it was um, said that the last person died in 1876. This is, this is a construct in which then the government isn't responsible for or needing to provision any compensation or any, any further negotiation or discussion with people to say they don't exist. Um, so this is the kind of education um, resource that accompanied that. Um, whoops, there. <coughs> this is from the 1830, the, the year of the great military campaign against us. Um, there's a map that you can find online that shows the movements of the military. It's pretty telling and really useful evidence that this did happen, that they created such a map. Um, <coughs> suggested in 1830 there were 500 men uh, and only 70 Aboriginal women and children under 10 years of age, 30. They say total in the woods, which is interesting, in the woods. But partly this, I think, refers to the number of Aboriginal people that were <coughs> living um, with colonists, which is partly what I'm focusing on in the recent years, including the artwork that's in Ever Present, which is how to find what happened to so many children that were taken when adults were missing. I'd say presumed killed. So that's uh, my work called um, Some Tasmanian Aboriginal Children Living with Colonists Before 1840, which is um, maybe going to be Guinness Book of Records longest title for an artwork. <laughs> Don't know. But um, anyway, for us, with a gloomy title. But uh, we were referred to in code by colonists in their journals and even in the newspapers as crows, black crows. So this was, this was a euphemism or metaphor for us being um, slaughtered. How many crows did you kill today? So that's this work, Murder of Crows. And it's also referring to an artwork by Fiona Foley called Annihilation of the Blacks, like these ways of, we, we all don't live in a vacuum. We are a community of Aboriginal artists across our continent that um, work in similar ways sometimes or we, we I think I find it really supportive to be part of this extra community as well as my fa family. <clears throat> and so just a few slides and then um, I'll, I think I might make it to the end of thing too, which is useful, good, good to do. Um, this is the panel that was produced on timber about the size of A4, so small, painted to communicate to Aboriginal people by produced um, <clears throat> by the government at the time. So. Governor Arthur, his surveyor, George Franklin, suggested that Aboriginal people can read pictographs. They, he said, our ancestors painted rude pictures with charcoal inside our huts, therefore communicate to Aboriginal people, we can do so via these pictographic panels. 
And we can suggest in 1830, that's what they're thinking, I'm paraphrasing maybe what they were thinking, that um, we can communicate in this manner. There's seven of these panels that survive in museums around the world and libraries. We don't know how many were issued or placed on trees, but um, there's one account of one Aboriginal man re re referring to it, seeing one of these. But to me, they've um, obsessed me for a while as well as another evidential object, though by 1830, uh, our numbers were not 600 men in the 600 people. We were probably around 100, if, in, if that, by um, around 1830. So um, this is another product to show colonists that the government's attempting something, and particularly, I think, back for in Whitehall in, in London to show that there'd been attempts at conciliation, of which there had not been. Um, so this, is a, this, uh, this next image on the right is a set of plywood, like life-size but maquette models for what I propose to be placed on our highway between the two big cities of our island. It's two and a half hour drive north to south. They used to be two colonies, but now they're one since 1811. Um, because about 18 years ago, a um, artist in, in this area we call the Midlands, which is perfect grazing country, and it was why we were uh, removed our ancestors. It was become sheep country and also cattle country. And uh, so, anyhow, the Midlands, we call it, like England, and we have all these counties that are the same as England. These figures have been up as uh, life-size or larger metal figures, silhouettes, for about 20 years. And I kept driving and thinking, where's any, any ab Aboriginal presence at all? Not evident. So um, I proposed and, and extracted them from this panel, which... The panel, if you read it from bottom to top, is, I think, trying to say, well, if, if, if we shoot you, we'll hang our own. If you spear us, we'll hang you, your people. Um, let's be friends, gov meet, meeting the governor, and, or, and let's hold each other's hands and children. To me, it's entirely sinister. So apart from proposing that, and was really fortunate this year that it actually eventuated, um, and they are out there on the Midlands Highway now, a life-size medal, figures, which took, um, I don't know what's the date there, but, um, it took a while, it took um, 11 years, is that 11 years, since 2011, and so yeah, 2020, earlier this year, I managed through the support of MONA, which is a large art museum in Tasmania, to support the production and installation of these for a festival, which is interesting in that festivals are, it's a week-long festival, and these are there for at least five years, so sometimes you need to think outside the white gallery you know, um, to produce something that otherwise might not get out outside of a gallery, a festival managed that, which is in um, well, like one minute, but I want to just reach the a bit more. These are more extractions from the panel. So how to redeploy what has been produced as propaganda and send it back to the colonists is what I'm interested in doing with these. Though I might have, I think, exhausted the kinds of things I can do with them. The first work in 1995 is actually held in Canberra at the National Gallery as well, where bathroom scales, I've painted the panel in the round, and your weight determines how you're implicated in that history. Are you being shot or hung or spit? <coughs> Shadow works. Um, about the loss of our children, um, which, and, uh, little, and little accounts of, of children living with colonists, Aboriginal children, our women being taken by sealers, sealing crews, sealing men capturing seals for what was known as the China trade, to send them up um, from Bass Strait through that trade network, escaping people from um, colonial, well, this is from the home of Robinson, the missionary, who was um, apparently well, known as the conciliator of our people. Um, I'm just clicking through time and then so this is where the work that is here in ever present um, and Dalrymple Briggs is um, one of my ancestors and one that did live with colonists taken as a child and her two sisters and brother lived uh, in a similar manner two on the streets of Launceston where they died as young women and um, since then I'll stop after this slide because in <clears throat> After making that work in 2008, I kept compiling and learning about which children live with colonists. And originally, I, I had a list of about 209 children, um, and now it's 185 children because I um, 
some of them were passed from home to home and their names were changed and they're the same children. It's, it's collapsed into less children but in, um, m more difficult stories than, than before to learn this of these children. So um, this became a work also during a, a festival by Mona in Hobart, the Dark Mofo Winter Festival. I was able to output the information trapped in my computer and make a temporary memorial work in the forest next to Government House in um, Hobart about the children. So um, this is really where I'm a bit uh, consumed with still attempting to find how many might have survived out of all of those children because um, most of them evaporate after their teens at the moment. Thanks very much. Thank you so much, Julie. What a what a wonderful and, and thought for bro provoking talk. And I'm sure we, we all have so many things to ask, but let's hold our questions to the end and I'll I'll invite Tony Albert to, to come up and share on his work. Hello, testing. Hello. <laughs> uh, thank you so much. Um, just like Julie mentioned, it is so wonderful to be here. Um, um, thank you so much, Julie. Um, Julie is um, what I'd say a very senior recognized artist in Australia and it's a privilege to sit and listen to her and when I say senior I don't mean in age I mean much more in cultural nuances um, and the importance um, of her work within the cultural landscape um, and there was some interesting tangents I think brought up um, between us both so in introducing myself um, I come from far north Queensland from three different language groups as was mentioned um, Gitame, Yirinji and Kukuyalanji and it's not uncommon uh, for many Aboriginal people to have multiple language groups through um, various family interactions and marriages um, and things like that. Um, uh, and, and it was interesting also listening to, you know, the, the names of the children and, and finding them out. Albert yeah, is a name that we don't, we don't know where it came from at all. It was um, the name that my grandfather enlisted in the war um, under. and. Um, None of his children ever thought to ask um, <laughs> where, where Albert came from, but he was a member of the Stolen Generation. Um, he was taken at two years old and had uh, seven siblings. Um, and uh, then his wife had, my grandma had 13, was one of 13 children. So we have a really big um, extended family, which is also not, um, not too uncommon. Um, in Australia as well within Aboriginal families. Um, so I come from a big family. Um, and another kind of really profound thing, Julie, when you were speaking as well that I realised is that you're saying that disconnection made you kind of maybe even more attached to discovering and exploring, um, you know, your, your, your home and your, your, your cultural lands. As someone who grew up very attached to where my family came from, even though we, we did travel quite a bit. Um, we were always sent home um, in, on, in school holidays and um, because of the size of our family, um, would love going and, you know, with our cousins and just, uh, just hanging around with family. I feel a little bit more like exact like the opposite. My work doesn't um, connect me to my country that much. My, I look at a lot of, um, you know, my identity based on who and where, how I live my life, things that affect me, much more political nuances within the cultural landscape. Um, and, um, and I guess I can talk a little bit more about that in this talk as well. This, I've, I've, um, I haven't even seen this slideshow, so um, <laughs> I don't know what's going to come up on it. I'm fortunate to have a great team of people around me that look after a lot of, um, a lot of the technical elements um, of my practice that I have no idea on, on how, how to do. Um, but um, I thought I would look at the work. If, if you have seen the show, um, there's a work um, called Ash on Me, um, which is made up well, primarily of, of vintage ashtrays with images of Aboriginal people on it. Oh, that's a good, good timing with that slide. So that's the work inside, um, inside the show. So a big part of my practice stems from a collection of what I call Aboriginalia. Um, that's just a made up word, um, but it means um, kind of kitsch Australiana or souvenir objects with images of Aboriginal people. Um, placed upon them and it and you'll see through 
um, the images, the extensive nature of which this um, this exists on plates and cups and tea towels. And uh, I'd like to say if it's being made, it's being made with an Aboriginal image on it, um, particularly within the, the vernacular of, of Australian tourism. Um, and I grew up with a love affinity for these objects. So as a, a, a youngster, a child, um, we got everything, all the necessities for life um, from thrift shops or secondhand shops, I'm sure. They exist in Singapore, I think, do they? Um, I haven't seen any here, but I'm um, a, a passionate um, uh, secondhand shopper. Um, but it is, it is like literally um, our lives. And uh, in, in Australia during the 80s, um, they had a certain kind of aroma to them. Um, so we would call them the smelly shops. And um, it was our weekend. It was like the treasure trove of, of our weekend. And my sister and I would, would um, go into our, our parents' room very early on a Saturday morning. So can we please go to the smelly shop this weekend? Um, so uh, it, it was where I came across this kind of ephemera and fell in love with it. It, it has... Um, you know, to the I, I always reach back to these very innocent childhood eyes of looking and seeing Aboriginal people, people that surrounded me in my life, on these objects and not having a realization at all, um, kind of the the sinister notion or undertones attached to them, or that that they were made without any profiteering of Aboriginal people or Indigenous people when involved in the manufacturing of them at all. Um, but nevertheless, I had wonderful parents who let me be who I was, and um, I, I grew this extensive collection um, of work. And it wasn't, I guess, until high school that I um, was looking more, you know, you, 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 you're starting to become your own person and detaching yourself from, you know, family politics and stuff and deciding on who you want to be. Um, and I was, you know, looking much more into um, art um, and, and culture and coming across amazing artists like Julie, um, Gordon Bennett and Tracy Moffat, who are also in the show, um, and understanding that art actually could be much more than just a pretty picture. Art can really... Um, can, can say something, can say something quite powerful. Um, and at that point, I still wasn't using the objects in any way, shape, or form. Um, I then went um, on to do a university degree within visual art. Um, it really was an incredible passion um, um, and interest um, of mine. And um, at one point, um, the collection grew to such a... Uh, uh, an abundance that it could no longer be housed within the, the home. Um, and it, it was getting, being stored, and it w was something I just had. You know, it, 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 it didn't really serve any other function but an addiction to collecting. Um, and uh, it, it was mainly in storage boxes, and I, and I would use things, um, or I would reference them in paintings. I come from a painting background. and. Um, it, it wasn't. Um, the, it still wasn't used in my in my practice. Um, and then uh, at one point, uh, I was kind of just playing with the collection, categorizing it. Sometimes I'd put all plates together, or I'd pull anything that was orange out of the collection. I'd just play, play with it in the studio. Um, and you know, because it was in the studio for the first time, so it became much more. Um, intrinsic to my thought process, the way I was working, the fact that it had surrounded me. Um, and the first, the first piece ever, um, which was entitled Headhunter, um, was a, a time where I had pulled out anything just with a physical head in it. Um, and, and I, I used the space and, and I started to spell out, um, use the, use the, um, Aboriginalia. Um, to, to actually write, write with it, because um, uh, text is another really amazing love of mine. Um, my cousin in the show, Vernon Aki, um, our grandfathers are brothers, and he's, he's part of that disconnected story of the stolen um, generation. Um, he has this great saying that um, English is his second language, he just didn't have an opportunity to learn his first language. So I feel, um, you know, very much the same as that, and I kind of use that symbolism as a as 
a, um, what's the correct terminology? I, I feel it gives me the right to bastardize the English language in a way that it's, it's, it's not only, because it's not my first language, and, but it's, it's the only language I know because of the systems in place within our country to deny people of knowing their language. So um, I, I play a lot uh, with language, I guess, is what I'm trying to say. Um, and so as I was making these big text base works and filling them up with the Aboriginalia. The ashtray was coming, was, was going in and then going out and then going in and going out. Um, and I just kept looking at the ashtray as a metaphorical symbol for the um, a position ascribed to our people within Australia. And there was something really intrinsic about what does it mean to butt out a cigarette on someone's face or on someone's culture. Um, and I decided when I came to that, um, meaning within myself that I wanted to make uh, a work especially about the ashtrays. So as I was uh, pulling things out of the collection and making other work, I was keeping ashtrays aside, which I had never done. Um, I'd never thought so um, intrinsic about a thing. Like the head one, that, you know, it was just heads, but nothing as specific as, as only using the ashtrays. Um, and it's amazing, I think, the relevance or the way in which these objects start to look as mass when, when you uh, amount them t together. So none of the ashtrays actually repeat each other or they're, they're you know, one style that's being collected over and over. They're all, they're all different. And it just goes to show the, the incredible amount of these objects, um, which I might add are very, very unfashionable in Australia now. Like you don't, you actually don't go and buy things. It, and that's why I think everything kind of melded so amazingly for me. The 80s was probably this peak time of people understanding that these objects aren't actually that great, trying to get rid of them, <laughs> and me wanting them. So they're, <laughs> so they're very, very cheap. Um, um, and, and, and now, I, I mean, it's, it's amazing that, that the way in which um, history negates and rot, like, now things tend, there's, there's almost like a, um, they're good because they're bad kind of scenario and like I can't afford them anymore. Um, but they're still, um, yeah, they're still quite um, amazing. And I, uh, they, they're still, I guess, uh, like not collected within the institutional framework, even like not so much art, but maybe in a museum um, uh, way of thinking because, you know, we can't deny that, um, like a whole generation of people grew up knowing and understanding and thinking about Aboriginal people through these objects. Um, like didn't even know an Aboriginal or have met an Aboriginal person in their life. But you know, the, you, you would have gone into anyone's house and, and seen at least one of these objects. Um, and and it, it would have been with um, uh, kind of a great sense of attachment or acknowledgement or a reference to um, Australian Aboriginal culture. Um, and it, uh, yeah, it spanned through a number of of different works at that time. So that works 2008, which is like about 14 years old. And I go I go in and out of um, looking and dealing with the collection. It's 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 a bit of a love hate relationship. It hasn't stopped. I've I've never stopped collecting, but I do. Um, I, I look a lot. Uh, conceptually at what I want to do or I think a lot about the thematics and, and, and it's usually um, about what's surrounding me or um, a thought process within contemporary art and then I decide what is the best way to execute the work so you as you would see throughout this there's not a common theme or element in just um, the way that I work it spans a lot of different things through photography video um, these works actually use um, fabric within the collection, so they're all built up um, with different fabrics. And I tend, and I've worked with a lot of paper in the collection. There's moments of kind of clarity for me where, um, like I never thought I'd use fabric out of the collection because of the, the kind of robust nature of the, the objects. Um, fabric never really worked or, or the fragility of paper doesn't really work within the, the broader schematic of what I was doing. But I've been able to go back to things at various times. So in 2015, I've traveled outside of Australia for about eight months. Um, 
And I was really kind of worried about, not so much worried, I just didn't know what I was going to do while I was traveling. So I took all, like, playing cards with me off with Aboriginal um, images on them, and that ended up pertaining to a body of work that I'm, I, I did. So um, I've been able to utilize a number of the collections in various different ways uh, throughout um, my career. And I'm also really big on, and I think um, Julie touched upon it as well, is pushing something to the nth degree. Like um, I never just make one body of work and then be like, okay, that's done. So the ashtrays I've done, a series of photographs have come out of it, the installation work. I kind of uh, take an, an idea and carry it as far as I possibly can. And some things never see the light of day. They, they, they fail and that's, that's not only, um, uh, that, that's a great thing I think um, artistically to, to, to be able to, um, to do. But um, uh, yeah, I, I've uh, continued um, through thematics quite a bit. But um, uh, yeah, I don't know that enough for, yeah, okay. <laughs> oh, well, thank you both so much. Two, two wonderful, really engaging talks, and I'm sure everybody has things they'd, they'd like to ask, but um, I'll, I'll start off with a kind of few, few questions to just get the ball rolling. And one of the things I was thinking about, you know, listening to both talks was, wondering about the reception of your work within Australia, you know, whether it's in you know, your own communities or the broader Australian audience. And Julie, you know, it's kind of embarrassing to say, but, but listening to your talk, you know, it brought back a memory for me of when I was a child, you know, actually hearing that, that there were no more Tasmanian Aboriginal people. I mean, that was a current belief, you know, even you know, within my lifetime. Um, and wondering, you know, in, to some audiences, I guess that must be very confronting and very provocative to, to have the history of, of Tasmanian Aboriginal people presented in such a way. So I wanted to ask about that. And then of course for Tony, the, the objects that you use uh, might be so familiar to people in another context and kind of you're forcing the audience to, to reevaluate what they really mean and to see them in a different way. So I thought perhaps you could both um, speak about that, you know, that idea about reception and, and also whether it's changed over time, if you've seen the reception change during the course of your careers. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, it's um, yeah. Well, I think the first first de um, decade of my work, I was looking at the whole of what was happening at the time of my birth and the whole of the country. I was having a different kind of ex experience and making that was also because um, a certain amount of that I was uh, living in Western Australia as well. So. Um, I think it, it, it's got darker and literally, but emotionally darker and darker and darker. The, the work that I've made are more and more specific to particular events, particular children. So it's it's um, really um, different. I think there's been different people who have um, been part of the journey as audience or viewers. Maybe not everyone's been on the whole journey with me. I'm not sure, but. The art has, has changed after the first decade a little. More, it was more humorous, perhaps, I think. Um, and then the reception I show most of my work is on mainland Australia because of the there's less opportunities, less galleries in Tasmania. Although the Mona effect has twice now um, assisted me to make work and have it seen by a larger audience during a festival, which is also interesting and problematic. The, the different type of audience that is coming maybe for a good time and then they get a Julie Goff time, you know. <laughs> so the children in the forest or, you know, the, the like, um, yeah, but I went, I've gone on those journeys to say, okay, let's try this with a big audience. But it is, then I don't want to go to the events associated where people are, you know, maybe drinking or having a good time. I'm like, you know, it's really like you feel responsible to, some of these works responsible to, you know, I mean, how they're, um, approached and experienced, but also um, what happens to them subsequent is something also on my mind. So, you know, are, are they, should they leave my, how should they leave this, the house? I don't have a studio, but I work in my house or in my van, van but, um, and so there's also this feeling of you know, works that I can or can't sell because um, you don't, if you don't know where something will go, there's a, if it's a very particular story of particular 
child or family or, you know, there's... So do you, you keep a lot of works with you? Um, yeah, some I just only have been once installed. Um, I'm ha much happier if they, um, if they can go to a, 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 a public collect a collection where they're um, not going to be on sold in an auction or... So it depends on the work, right? But quite a few feel... Um, yeah, quite a few are under my house. Some have been in bonfires to say goodbye. So, but uh, yeah, some and some I feel uh, like I've been making some prints and that's been interesting and this idea of additioning and that's also like a, a useful um, a way to survive as an artist as well, to think, okay, I should try to figure out how to uh, make some works for, that can sell, sell. And also um, there's this, I've been in early days particularly more, but, but still this um, accused to, of being too didactic perhaps. So how much I feel this educational imperative is a, is a problematic for making a successful artwork and, as well. So anyway, there's always different potential audiences that, and, uh, and uh, uh, where arts, artworks might um, end up as well. But I suppose, you know, to an extent, you, you must feel that the didacticism is a necessary part of your practice you know, for, for addressing the kind of histories that have been presented in the past. Um, I think I've so far been able to make a few different blog sites where I, I put the information and I'm trying to see how much I can m make it less and less that people must learn X, Y, Z on the same journey I've been on through the work. But it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a challenge for me to do that. But try to think, okay, if it's about the, the, the information, I can find another output for that and, and let the, try to let the um, creative, the aesthetic, something else be on parody, you know. Yeah, so Tony, um, could you say something about the reception of your work and whether it's, whether it's changed over time or, or what it's meant to, to different audiences that it's been presented to? Yes. Um, <laughs> um, how's it changed? Um, I think I've been really fortunate that the 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 voice that the work uh, um, brings into the public realm has kind of been fairly well received. Given that there is, um, I mean, there's a tension within it that that straddles. Um, you know, the very problematic nature of uh, Australian history. Um, and the objects themselves very much serve and continue to serve uh, at that point that Aboriginal people are meant to be seen and not heard. Um, and by giving these, these objects a voice, um, you know, that, that was my primary um, kind of reason for using them. But we do come from a country that is barren of, and it did come up in Julie's talk of Aboriginal indicators. But, it, the, and, um, but it, it is full of um, uh, uh, statues or memorials to, to white men who, who massacred our, our people, and they're everywhere. I mean, it's similar. There's no, you know, women are also void within that conversation or that visibility um, as well. So I, I think oh, what I will say is that more recently that, that, op that visibility and that opportunity for Indigenous engagement with into the landscape is improving um, quite a bit and is testament to, I think, um, the art world in particular as being really at the forefront of those kind of conversations. Um, uh, but, um, and, I, and I see a big difference now as, as like a father and, and, and children at school. Like we didn't even have an Aboriginal flag at our school and now you know, there, there's flags hanging and there's a lot of visual iconography within school. So uh, I, I would like to think that there is, there, you know, is, is a changing pathway that was not an, an opportunity definitely for, for us as Aboriginal people. But the sinister and dark undertones, um, particularly within, uh, um, you know, capitalism and um, uh, corporate greed and climate and mining is all still, you know, very ingrained within an Australian vernacular. Mm. Well, I'm, I'm going to follow that very serious point with a really flippant question, which is I really want to know, how often does it happen to you that someone comes up and says, oh, I had one of those? Really, really, 
Very common, yeah. Um, people give me stuff as well, which is great. Um, it used to be really intrinsic to my practice to find the object. Um, and and as, as you grow and change and age, all those things kind of um, become different. So people give me things. Um, and what has been one of the hardest things for me academically is to find information and research about these objects because um, this is pre-internet kind of time and when these big, they're not big companies, the companies close down, it's for a reason and people don't want to associate themselves <laughs> in terms of owning or having owned or produced them. But I found, you know, there have been people who are like, there's a, a little city, Sydney pottery company, and I've met people that are like, oh, we used to sit and paint the little boomerangs and, you know, oblivious to, it, it, you know, at, at times I'm sure people thought they were doing a really wonderful um, thing, you know, um, in terms of uh, highlighting that, you know, we're, we're it, yeah, it, it, it's very interesting, but more, um, I think, you know, we, we're at this point of, of for worse terms, reconciling our, as, as a nation ourselves with these kind of objects or that kind of imagery. And maybe even compared to 10 or 20 years ago, I think the opportunity to engage in a much greater conversation is, is, more, relevant, is, is more potent now. I think people are, uh, are feeling more comfortable about um, reconciling uh, with a, a family history or understanding um, you know, because it, it's, it's not uncommon within the Australian vernacular that um, you, your, your family has profited from Indigenous disadvantage. Um, and so that's, uh, I think, it, it's something that we grapple with as, as a nation, um, you know, incredibly. And that there's going to be a long, long time of, for, for that to heal. But... And, and you know, so we we would have to see what path that takes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I wanted to go back to to what you mentioned about the kind of research process behind the works, because I think for Julie as well, I mean, there's a, there's a very meticulous kind of forensic process of research that underlies the artworks. So I wanted to ask you, you know, when you, for example, the work that we have in the ever present show about about the, the children. Um, what kind of sources do you draw on? You know, how how can you make such an? Ex I mean, it's really extraordinary considering you know there's a sort of interest in in many ways in not preserving that information in the first place, and then I guess in later periods in not having it accessible. You know, how do you overcome some of those boundaries in the, the research process? And what what kind of sources can you draw on? Yeah, um, so that that's very much that one is this like you say sort of forensic archival work through the um, baptism, There's the rec records are more and more since then online as well, so that's changed um, the, yeah, the access and amount of information that I can look through even from my house, which is strange, because part of the whole research has been one work I made called LC347, video work that's online, is me um, going in, sitting in the archives and accessing a file that I was alerted to by an archivist, which has is, is happened about four times in my life, but I'm greatly appreciated when someone actually points me in the direction of something I wouldn't have found otherwise. So it's otherwise um, unindexed box of correspondence and records in which was two mention of Aboriginal people, one the sister of my ancestor. So, but the video is of me opening the box and typing typing the um, what I'm finding if I, I can see you know 100 paces in that old writing the word Aboriginal or native now so it's sort of I'm just typing these records out and that's uh, sharing that immediately with anyone that views the artwork um, the moment that I'm typing out something and seeing it is always the time that any of you would be seeing it it's a per it's, per it's an ever another ever present moment right I wanted that because there's a shock you know the shock of uh, what is going to be unfolding in this account, um, and so yeah, because that's it's very different in the ha in the house, in at home or else otherwise. Looking up baptism records, looking through the colonists, the names of all the back, trying to find a child that may be um, have a father that is a sealer, it may or may not say a native child because we have no child because of um, the way the blood quotum means that people can be um, can stop being seen as Aboriginal in the records. So there's 
just trying to find the kids, uh, the anomalies, how many are baptised the same day as a colonist child that would indicate that they may be living with that family because otherwise they're just in a limbo. If it's the only child baptised that day, that Aboriginal child, who are they living with? You know, someone that cared to get them baptised and what does that mean for um, some... There's some people that were our warrior ancestors who died young. We call them ancestors even if they are not... Um, didn't have descendants because of the ones that fought for all of us. In, um, they, there's some that were, um, yeah, very interestingly, were never brought to trial for what they did, but they were, um, you know, in town, you know, invisible, uh, were there, visibly able to be put on trial for what they enacted against colonists. And it's because it's come through the, um, various conversations with people that it's probably because they were baptised that the colonists didn't want them to be sworn under, they could be sworn under oath and they could give evidence against what the colonists had done to, to our people, you see. There's, there's so many different ways of trying to understand, understand the lives of, of uh, different people according to what they'd lived through as with the colonists or not. Um, so yeah. it's almost like you, you also have to look at the emissions. You know, there's a lot of detective work in kind of putting together the, the gaps in the evidence based on what you know might have been the practice at the time, you know, based on what, yeah. what records persist. Mm. That's one, yeah, that's one thing I'm really wanting to do is work with some people to find people to work with, digitally map the children where they were all living because I think their evidence, their surviving evidence of, of violence, massacres, where they lived, who they lived with, and, and so look at the land grants of those they were living amongst, the colonists, and look at the movements of the five military regiments around our island, uh, and um, try, and the, and the newspaper accounts of violence, and try to understand where large numbers of Aboriginal people were slaughtered that is missing, because I think that these are all layers of clues that will indicate, we will find those telling absent, those telling gaps that are going to be loud once it's mapping technology that's needed really it's also like no make no mistake why this information is missing um what happened in our history and who was left to write our history are both intrinsically linked into why this information doesn't exist because it will prove guilt um we all know um you know that history and why it doesn't exist within the the vernacular of our education system or within our record keeping or anything like that. So it's important to understand those two tangents and you know, who is left to write history and how is it written and from what vantage point it is written from. Absolutely. And I saw in, in your presentation that you've been looking back at Australian art history too. So I noticed the series of, of works engaging with Margaret Preston. So I was wondering if you could say more about that and, and perhaps our audience might not be familiar with Margaret, Margaret Preston and, and her relationship to, to Aboriginal representation. Um, well, Margaret Preston is an incredible Australian artist, um, uh, uh, I, and I think very forward forward thinking for for her time. And I think a lot of that is attributed to her being a, a female artist of of her generation, um, someone who was considered um, within the the kind of big boy vernacular of Australian art at the time that to be a bit of a Sunday painter. You know, she did vases of flowers and stuff like that, and was was quite ridiculed um, because of that. But she had a thought that while Australian art history at the time, there were artists traveling um, to Europe and um, you know, various countries for education and looking at a, a vernacular within art, she, she stood up and went, we have, uh, um, there is a style or a, a framework attached to Australian art that should include indigenous iconography. Um, so, um, and, and, and sh the, the, there is a number of series, like almost Aboriginal art series that she has where she, she has replicated indigenous designs, um, still lifes, um, done patination. Uh, she did amazing work, the expulsion of, of Adam and Eve as um, two Aboriginal people that weren't allowed into heaven. Um, so really kind of interesting things. Um, and I, I, like, I, I like to say that because I don't want people to think like, I'm just shitting on her as an artist because that's not like my intention at all. It was really an investigation. But what happens when people, particularly within art vernacular, at the kind of the highest echelon of um, society, that ripple effect that that kind of thing has. And by her reproducing these objects and the, these cultural 
um, iconography, how that kind of filtered down into what interests me the most and the, the, the tea towels and the fabrics. So she had a line of fabrics and a line of interior um, decorations for the home with indigenous motifs upon them. So whilst there was a very good intention behind it, it there was, you know, it, it actually was really super problematic in, in the effect of it. So basically what I've done is I've reproduced um, iconic images of hers, but using the appropriated fabrics um, as as to, as the colour um, definitions. So, so these were actually her fabrics. Part of the no, fabric no, I know. Oh, no, this is more of the the rip off fabrics oh, right. that okay. uh, accounted for. I, I mean, her fabrics would probably be in museum collections and worth. It would be sacrilegious to kind of cut up. I'm sure her beautiful, her beautiful fabrics with the best of intentions she had. Um, that um, you know, I, I just feel you know, there's a, there's great. Um, she's because uh, the show I had. This is a very new um, body for me, and I'm, I'm embarking on a second series of that, and it's called Conversations with Preston because it's kind of this posthumous idea of what. I would love just to sit and have a, a cup of tea with her or a martini or something and, um, and just say what, um, like, because there's images of her, she, she did tours and she's got photos with Aboriginal people, but at that time, I'm sure there wouldn't have been a great deal of dialogue. Like, it would have been a, a point in history where, where she went, probably people weren't speaking English and she wouldn't have been speaking that language. Um, like a, did she just reproduce these objects, which it seems like she did, or was there a greater in-depth? Um, I wonder how, just how far she took it. It, it was very leading while still being, um, I don't want to say behind, because that's not the, the right word. Um, well, I mean, today in today's terms, it's a kind of cultural appropriation that's yeah, e extremely yeah. offensive. But yeah. I mean, I suppose historically her, her position was and then within the Attempting Australian something. art world, no one, no one still wants to have that conversation. That's not put in a light of maybe, um, I think, where it should be. I'd really surprise, like, they kind of come out, uh, actually, the, the sum of the work I, um, the, the direct imagery, which is based in collections, I haven't seen out on display for a really long time, and I don't know if it, it ever will be, but it's part of that kind of hope and these bigger conversations that you can dissect and understand how that happened. But it's, it's a really big interest in me, kind of the, the way in which um, this, it, it kind of re-entered the vernacular of, of who, we, who we are as people and that identification of, of um, Aboriginality within um, a Western framework. Hmm. All right. Um, well, perhaps it's time to, to let our audience ask some questions. So, um, would anyone like to begin? Yeah, please raise your hand. Hi. Thank you so much, uh, Julie and Albert. And it takes me back to the time when I actually lived and studied in Queensland for four years. And I studied about sociology and the history of the Aboriginal people in Australia. So, and felt very much for them. Uh, so I understood then as a student that uh, the Aborigines have a really intimate relationship with the land, like the land is their identity. And there's also a spirituality uh, that they have about the land in the way that the whites do not comprehend or have. And I was just wondering that in your work, uh, both Julie and Albert, that whether you try to kind of uh, reflect that, uh, the, the, the way that what land means to the Aboriginal people, and uh, which I think is very important. I, I do a lot of nature work in Singapore. And I've, I mean, that, that memory of the Aborigines have never left me, of how important and how intimate that the land was to them. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Um well, there'd be so many different hundreds of, uh, we've got hun hundreds of nations of Aboriginal people with and completely different experiences even within those nations of the individuals for the connections they have to their country, which is us and our ancestor, ancestors are country. But I, 
hoping through what I've said really that I'm on a journey of trying to get still over fences and through gates back to country. So I have more a sense of lament and how much is possible in a lifetime to try to reconnect. And I'm, but then Gina could speak well to this because of her meeting so many artists from around our continent who um, many do have direct, you know, much more direct um, responsibilities to country that they're able to attend to, you know. And most of my traditional country is a pastoral estate and also there's national park. And both of those have um, problematics for our, like our problems in different ways for us to be there, but also what we are allowed to do to, to be on those, on those places. Uh, and also there's, in recent years, uh, our community have created a cultural walk, a tour, like w can we be economically self-sustaining with our country and what that might mean as well? Like what does that, what is that relationship with country to create something that you can produce yourselves about and with your country? So that's, that's emerging and positive because people then are able to spend time there and that's um, I think um, something to think about more. I was just uh, thinking about some, m most of what I'm able to do as an artist is, um, you, as an artist you can be a non-threatening perhaps, I think it might be a ploy or a, what methodology as an artist I can say, I'm making an artwork, may I visit, may I go to this hill or this place through your lock gate colonist. I don't say that little bit, but um, <laughs> it's a bit more threatening. Yeah, yeah. Open your gate, you bastard. <laughs> but open the gate. So, but it is like, a, how far am I willing to go to go somewhere, to be somewhere, and how much will it be that I'm implicated in some kind of beyond dialogue? What what is that doing for me for the future? Is it? Um, I don't want it to assuage guilt if we don't even know what. They don't know or do they know what their families have done or what – it's very messy to get on country, you know, to be uh, – yeah, so reuniting with that place. But um, recently for various artworks, I've had a lot of these conversations with colonists at Gates and it's been particularly interesting to understand how also they refer to country. So one man who allowed me to place the figures I mentioned the, on, on, on a hilltop um, – the land below is all dead, grazed out, you know, bereft of trees, poor. This is the whole Midlands. So, but the hilltops, we get up to this hilltop and there's uh, rocks and lizards and um, orchids, beautiful. And I said, wow, this is, I felt like, oh, finally, you know, I'm somewhere a bit magical still, a bit like the old times. And uh, I said, wow, look at this. And he said, oh, he said, oh, it's unimproved land. That's a farming term. Can you believe that? Unimproved. Is it? Nature is, un, you know, is unimproved. I'm like, oh my God, I didn't know what to do with that. So anyway. Um, it's, that's a really important question because my answer 20 years ago would be about closing the gap between two different people and bringing that understanding of who we are closer together and uh, eliminating a lot of the otherness. And I think that was a, a really amazing way um, to move forward, uh, particularly in uh, uh, a place like Australia with such a small colonial history. Now I look at it much more as the within the Indigenous art. You know, we're, we're living in a climate crisis now, and my my thought now is more about making the viewer more in tune. That taking a layer away between them and the earth itself, and that's going back to Indigenous philosophy and principle we have cared for and maintained country for hundreds of thousands of years, and we need to go back to looking and listening to um, indigenous philosoph philosophy around land management. We are the least to contribute to the climate crisis, but because of our regional and remote locations that we live in, we are the first to witness the, it's the impact that um, the climate is having upon our community. So my, my thing has changed now between people, but giving a viewer, just, just take a going away from the idea of ownership to belonging. Just different ways of thinking about how closely related to the earth we are. And we, re we need to um, re 
I don't know, get in there and shuffle things around and change our perspectives and the way we think to turn this crisis around because it is, it is an absolute crisis. It is at, at, um, you know, at its most critical um, and things have to be done now. And so that's, I think, where my, the, the, my artistic journey has taken me on changing that, a dialogue between two people but now looking at a dialogue between who we are as people and w where we walk, where we sit, where we live um, is, you know, where I am now. And, and actually we, we have another really resonant work about that in the exhibition, which is Jonathan Jones' piece with the, the grindstones, which is a, a celebration of the traditions of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander, first people's land management and custodianship of the land, you know, since time immemorial, and the environmental knowledge that that, that long... Um, retained, you know, prior to, prior to colonisation. Um, yeah, would anyone else like to ask a question from the floor? Yes, up the back. Hi, um, I'm from Nipalina, Lutruwita, and I just wanted to say to Julia, I'm profoundly sorry that that's the history of our beautiful island. And I also wanted to say um, thank you so much for the work that you're doing to uncover the truth and to, to let us know the true history of our island. So thank you. Thank you for saying that. Hi, this is a question for Julie. Um, you're having grown up in, <laughs> having grown up in, in Melbourne and, and uh, you know, the, the milk bar that you, you, when you were a little girl, at what point did you sort of um, have a cultural awakening? Uh, you know, were you very aware of your heritage? Um, yeah, I, w I was. I was. I didn't understand what what extended family, what it meant to be part of a, a much bigger family, and then what that means beyond that to community. Till I moved as an adult to Tasmania, which only in the last several years that we, we understand one of our names is Lutruwira. So I, I grew up, my nan was from Tasmania. She moved to Victoria for work, for work. And that was, I think there's a substantial number of families that have had that, the movement across to the mainland and working, some people making their way back. Um, but fortunately for me, my community, my family in the Devonport region knew of all of us and it wasn't, it wasn't something that was a multi-generational or a complex return of not knowing where, who we, or how, or where we fit. Or so it was for me, though, really a very big, a very big and significant awakening to know the detail after I got moved back, literally beyond, in, beyond my nan's own life and story, to know why why we are who we are how we how we came to be that i had no idea about our uh, history and, and the violence i didn't understand any of this growing up just um about nan and her generation and not before and i did so i didn't know that we come from a sig really significant leader of our people called manalagena didn't know that didn't know even that we came from his daughter, Wotamurtiana, and that though her and her sisters are three of the key ancestors of our community, not all. There's also, um, there's even here today, someone comes from another significant matriarch. So I, I really feel um, incredibly fortunate to have made my way to live on our island. But as in doing that, you can't avoid, um, you can't, av you, it's a d more difficult path than, than a it's not an academic exercise or not something that I'm living in on mainland Australia and learning. When you're living back on our island, it's um, every breathing moment is part of the trying to find solutions or trying to navigate um, things that are wrong, you know, and, and, and not sure how to attend to them, especially I feel a reticence through um, growing up as a child elsewhere that I'm not always sure I should I think oh will I grow up to be a bit more assured or assertive about some of this that I 
tend to work through as artists, which might be also an avoidance of responsibility. Yeah, so it's a tenuous path of return when you've I was born in Melbourne, not just grew up there. You know what I mean? It's quite significant for me that I um, have that to work through. Thanks, Julie and Tony um, and Phoebe as well. It's been really fascinating and a privilege uh, to be here listening to your words about your work. Julie, I had um, a question for you which is a little bit tangential. It was, um, I'm interested in how your work, your practice as an artist and the, the practical activism that that embodies um, of, and meshes or impacts on your work, your curatorial practice within an institution that obviously has such a terrible, terrible history of misrepresenting or even not representing the people whose collections it has, it houses and has stolen, essentially. Yeah, it's. Um yeah, I, I, I sort of, I wake up each day and think, oh my God, I'm working in the, in this museum and art gallery that is the one, that, the first one of our island and founded from the, from the Royal Society of Tasmania, like this um, critically colonial um, group of self-asserted, asserting scientists who, whose aim was um, to become viewed as experts in, in Britain, you know, this sort of southern outpost to be these um, lauded, lauded scientists and part of their work was to um, treat us as, um, as uh, you know, biology, as insects, animals and Aboriginal people, all this realm to study and to dissect and send back to, to, um, the, to London and Edinburgh and all, all, even the US. So I'm not sure how to answer it really. I, I, I can't believe that I work in there but the institution is making, you know, um, constantly and in recent five or so years in particular attempts to um, redress and bring to light what has happened there. So one year ago there was an apology from the Royal Society that's still, you know, still a kind of, uh, still attached to TMAG and headquarters are there to apologise for what was enacted upon our ancestors. Um, including actively collecting our ancestors' remains and putting people on display, um, yeah, but it's, I'm not, I, yeah, I don't, I don't know, it's hard, people, this is our question, do we try to enact change from within these problems, these places that, that are problems, or from outside? Um, and the, I think it's just that you, you're, you have to, if to survive it, you need to feel that you're on a real A race and you're going to hand the baton on when you're tired because um, you don't actually succeed to make enough change necessarily as an individual. You don't as an individual, but also um, when you realise the work ahead, who, who can, m m you know, um, drill a different kind of hole or, you know, it feels very much like a, uh, yeah, it's almost, uh, yeah, it's definitely doesn't, it's not what it is on paper, such a, a role in there. And I think um, that also brings up a really interesting issue of kind of the, the network of relationships that's required to make change and the idea of kind of collaboration and, and community. And I actually wanted to ask Tony because you mentioned um, Vernon Aki in your talk and I know you, you told me earlier that you used to work with Richard Bell you know, earlier in your career. So I wanted to ask you about the, the community of artists in Brisbane um, and how you know, that, that group of artists kind of affected your work and, and I guess you know, impacted the development of your practice. Um, yeah, sure. Um, so, uh, I mean, across Australia, there's great networks and communities of people. I've always found Brisbane to be quite unique, though, in that um, uh, the, the the support ne mechanisms in place um, and the way in which then you continue that. I'm I'm constantly at the university um, if I need help with a work, I mean, you know, or any students there or. or or whatever, but um, yeah, I was a R Richard, we would sit under this tent, I was Richard's um, artist assistant for years. Um, we actually were part of a collective called Proper Now, 
um, but it, it's it's interconnected family history stuff. It, it's like-minded. We we were in a position where we felt, I guess, that um, uh, our, our our mission statement was to challenge the position that is ascribed to Aboriginal art, and in doing so, we felt very much outsiders within the context of framework and institutions. We're not kind of very interested in what we're doing, um, and the the only way we could do what we did was through the support of each other. Um, so that um, is something I see um, reflected um, in a lot of different places, but never, never really as much as what I find in Queensland, having been in Sydney for the past decade and coming back to Brisbane. Um, I always say, uh, oh, it's, it's a bit embarrassing maybe. Um, like, Brisbane, you, you, there's this mentality of um, how are you and how can I help you? And Sydney was a bit like, who are you and what are you taking away from me by being here? So it taught no me to comment. be really, it taught me to be really tough and really strong. But there's just different. Well, I mean, Tasmania is probably another similar place of, you know, where 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 we're much smaller um, uh, 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 place and and you've got to make do with just what you've got. You you really come together. So we're constantly, you know, talking about our art to each other. And it's like, oh, have you seen this book? Have you seen this video? Do you want? I've got this and this. So it, it just being very open. Um, uh, philosophically in, in the way in which we are as artists to each other, which I, I always think, um, you know, replicates also, again, a very indigenous philosophy of sharing, helping each other out and stuff like that, whereas, you know, there are other places, in, yeah, that, you know, people don't like to share anything or show you what they're doing or kick their studio door. Off. I never even shut my studio door. Like, it's just <laughs> was this open, revolving place of people coming in. And um, I, I um, yeah, that's just, but I, I I carry that on now, and I would like to think that anyone that I do that work with continues that tradition of being able to to you know help each other out and, and work for. I, I love um, you know I love sharing. Yeah. Do you remember when you finished the drawing of my brother? That you made it much better. He, of um, <laughs> at the on the printing the printing. Yeah, I was trying to draw my brother, and it, it looked pretty dodgy. And Tony f <laughs> finished it. That's and right, yeah, yes. It. And it's, um, yeah. The power of collaboration even yeah. between these two. <laughs> I'd love to see that work. <laughs> um, well, I think, I think we have time for, for a last question if anyone else has one from the floor. Okay, so my question, I think, um, from what I gather by doing this art that both of you did, is giving a voice to the Aboriginal people. And my question is, how do you think that you could increase this, uh, giving them that voice back, you know, that voice to them that was taken away from them uh, in Australia. Like, in what ways do you envision giving the voice back to the Abor Aboriginal people? Um, I, I'm privileged to do a lot of work with inside the institution as well. I worked for the Queensland Art Gallery for eight years and I'm currently a trustee at the Art Gallery of New South Wales. So when we look at the idea of being, that idea of being inside the institution and outside, my, I can best work for my community from the inside of an institution. But what that means is those people outside that are um, e either protesting or being vocal against that to to, to, to also understand and, and realize why are they are there as well. That there's not one idea or one uh, way of being which exists that is the right or wrong thing. I just know from my perspective the best work I can do is from by advocating from within. Um, but the most, you know, I, I can only do that by acknowledging those who stand on that on the outside in protest and stand also in solidarity with them. There's a lot of talk within institutions at the moment, this idea of decolonizing. And I actually don't think you can decolonize a colonial building, but what you can do is indigenize it, but that has to be through indigenous autonomy. And so what that means is we need institutions to actually give up that stronghold, the board of, of you know, I'm, I'm one of 12 people, but the only Aboriginal person on the board, it's just not, it's not, Good enough. I, I can't take on that role on my own. I need other voices and advocates, but I need those other people that sit around that table to understand. Not that I, I'm not there to make all the decisions, but that decision making needs to be done without 
their involvement as well sometimes. And that's this kind of, again, this relinquishing of, of power in making something better or understanding something. So um, I guess that's, that, that's my standpoint point from it but um, there's important conversations that are having but we need we've got this movement first nations first and that's a really important thing to look at and consider and sometimes it's better to actually just sit and listen it's not much to add to that but it's a, nothing about us without us that's not the same thing and yeah yeah you're more I think I'm a bit worn down but yeah the idea of being within and trying while you're there it's Im imperative to do that um, and there are good projects underway with our community but also keeping our like raid keeping it open and listening and seeing what we can bring to our island or our artists can have opportunities elsewhere like that it's not me on the chair next year other people you know that who how to keep it um, actively more open than because I I'm very fortunate and yeah just want to be mindful of that who else can be um, having opportunities well I, I think that's a, a really passionate and powerful place to leave this artist talk so um, please join me in thanking the wonderful Julie Goff and Tony Albert thank you so much for being here with us in Singapore <laughs>